Good afternoon. Welcome to today's colloquium, The Brain in Space, by Henry Kennedy. I'm certain that those of you who have cut short your Easter vacation to be here today will, uh, will feel at the end that you've made the, the correct choice. Professor Kennedy received the Bachelor of Science degree in London. After a brief stint in the French Army, which is not on his CV, but is an amusing story, he received the PhD degree in 1978 at Université Claude Bernard in Lyon. He was a postdoc at the University of Oxford with Professor Whitridge before taking a position in Lyon. Currently, uh, Professor Kennedy is head of the Institute of Stem Cell and Brain Research of the INSEM and also is head of Cortex, of the Cortex Project in Lyon, a multidisciplinary consortium of, 16, of six institutes comprising 15 research teams. The study of cortical networks represents the dawn of neuroscience from the 1890s until the 1920s. The undisputed pioneer was Ramon y Cajal, a Nobel laureate in 1906, whose drawing of cerebral cortex connectivity uh, you see projected now. Later, functional measures of the living brain activity were invented, single neuron electrophysiology, magnetic resonance imaging, and so on. Many neuroscientists by the 1990s seemed to have lost sight of the underlying anatomical structure which constrains brain function. However, with the 21st century came the decision in the United States to promote the integrated exploration of structure and function. A decision supported by investments of billions of dollars, uh, for instance, through the Allen Brain Institute and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute campus at Tunelia Farm. No such in investments have been made in Europe. Um, nevertheless, we have major players like today's speaker. In, in biology, we can ask a question that would seem out of place in much of mathematics and physics. Why are things the way we observe them? It doesn't make that much sense, typically in physics or math, to say, why are things the way they are? They simply are that way. In biology, on the other hand, uh, things are the way that we see them because they've been conserved or else progressively refined in the course of evolution. The rules of cortical co connectivity must have optimized something to provide a selective advantage to the organism that bears these uh, rules and this connectivity. But what is optimized? Selective uh, metabolic energy, space, processing speed, or something else, or a combination? With this question, I give the microphone to Henry Kennedy, literally, because we have to use the microphone for the recording. Thank you. Hello. And uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be here. So um, the title of my talk is rather pompously The Brain in Space. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking actually more about the limitations of what we know about the brain rather than so much about what we do know. Uh, since Ram and Cajal, uh, exquisite descriptions, there hasn't been as much progress in understanding the brain or the structure of the brain uh, as we would like to think. Um, a lot of my talk is going to touch on how is it that we made so many mistakes in recent years about what is the brain structure. The reason why I'm calling this the brain in space is because um, the, the anatomy that we've been doing and the modeling that we've been doing on that anatomy suggests that the topological models, the very mathematical abstract models that people have been making about the cortical connectivity, really don't apply. It turns out that it's the embedded features of the cortex that really allows you to make an abstraction which will give a high degree of prediction concerning what you can find in terms of the geometry of connectivity. This is very, very different from the models which have been 
fan which are being handled around, which are being publicized, and which have become so very popular. So, in some sense, some of the things I'm going to be saying goes very much against the grain. Now, the, the work I'm going to be describing is going to be very important for you to understand. I'm a biologist. I collaborate with some very patent, patient physicists and mathematicians who have done a lot of the modeling which I'm going to be showing you today. Almost everything I'm going to be presented is published. So this is not going to be a data talk. I'm going to slide across the top of the data. But it will be important when I get to the credits because this has been very much a concerted effort. In fact, we were talking earlier. Um, we're very often encouraged to do multidisciplinary work. Be careful because this is what we've been doing and it's very difficult to get published. Uh, editors don't take the trouble to really consult reviewers that can span uh, the width of the, of, of the science that you need to span. So, um, without further ado, um, this is Lyon. This is where I'm living. I'm living in Lyon. This is the River Seine, uh, which is just outside my, uh, my flat. So, I'm going to be talking about topological versus spatially embedded networks. I'm going to insist on why the spatially embedded network really does tell you a lot about what the cortex is doing. I think that it's highly predictive. I'm going to be looking at the aerial level. You know that the cerebral cortex has various areas which are specialized to deal with different sorts of information. You have a consortium of auditory areas, visual areas. So I'm talking about the connections between areas. But I believe that perhaps some of the um, findings that we've been having with this embedded notion actually might go down to a, a, a finer level. The mammalian brain shows an enormous scale of sizes. And when brains change size, when you go from these very small moles, where the brain is a, a fraction of a gram, to um, hippopotamuses and whales and very, very, very large mammals, that change in brain size is amazing in terms of the problems it poses for the connectivity. And so recently we've been comparing what we've been describing in the macaque to what, what exists in the mouse and I'm very, very surprised that the embedded features we've described in the macaque are as clearly defined in the mouse as they are in the macaque and I'll touch on that. These uh, notions of embeddedness and the, uh, the whole idea of networks is actually a long way from the preoccupations of a lot of physiologists. If you're working as a physiologist on the cortex, what you're very interested in is hierarchical processing. Why do you have 10, 12, 15 visual cortical areas? What is the nature of the interactions between these areas which allows you to propose that they're involved in, in deciphering the uh, information contained in the visual image. And I'll talk a little bit about that. I probably won't get down to talking about unique features of primate corticogenesis, but, you know, a lot of um, where I come from has been struggling with using the non-human primate as a model for understanding the human brain. And indeed, there are a lot of very, very unique features. <laughs> So this discovery that we've had, which I'm going to be presenting to you, where we find a lot of similarity between the mouse, the small mouse, smooth mouse brain, and the larger macaque brain, uh, goes against uh, something which I'm totally convinced of, which is that the non-human primate is a necessary model if we're going to understand the human brain, because there's so much which is very, very, very different. And uh, part of my work is, is involved with Colette de Hay looking at corticogenesis in, in non-human primates. And a number of people are doing that kind of thing in humans, and it's very similar and completely different from what you find in mouse. So I, I'll try and talk about that very, very much at the end, but I won't cover it in any detail. This is what I'm not doing. <laughs> I, I don't know any many of you who know what this is. It's um, It's... Tractography is a probabilistic way of looking at um, uh, what might be connections. It's looking actually at water diffusion under a high magnetic field. 
and then tracing out via tractography the probable connectivity. Um, recently, the consortium in which I'm working, but also other laboratories across the world, have been looking to see how, how faithful is the connectivity that you get with this whole brain imaging technique, non-invasive, so you can do this to humans and you can work out this, this is from a human brain, how um, accurate it is when you compare it to what I will be talking about, which is track tracing. So track tracing, you inject a molecule, it's captured by the terminals, in the case I'm looking at it's retrograde transport, and it's actively transported in the axons and then deposited in the, in the cell bodies. And so when you look at the cell body and where they're located in the brain, you can show that there's a connection between the structure you injected and where that cell body finds itself. This is track tracing. When you compare track tracing to tractography, it shows you that the results are very, very mediocre. Uh, and over any kind of distance, very inaccurate. And it's the long distance connection. Yes. No, it doesn't move again. There are track tracing techniques where it does move across the synapse, but not in the techniques that we've been using. So that's quickly going across that. Now, these, here we have two uh, databases. This is a summary of two databases, two connectomes. This is a popular word at the moment. It just means looking at connectivity in a very systematic fashion, in fact. Uh, these are two connectomes on the left, uh, this is a database that we produce on the macaque, and on the right, this is the compilation of two studies published in 2014, which gives you the connectome of the mouse. And what is immediately apparent, if you compare these two connectomes, is the density of connectivity in the cortex is very, very high. It's around about 70%. 70% of the connections that can exist do exist. So, in fact, most cortical areas are connected to most other cortical areas. And I'm going to be showing you, in a very simplistic fashion, why that's important. So, I'm going to be talking about what was fashionable, which was the topological model. And the topological model, which has been uh, greatly exposed, is the so-called small world. The small world model came from experiments by milligram in the... Uh, in the uh, 70s, 60s, 70s, and basically it was uh, a model of social networks. If you want to understand disease propagation and rumor propagation, the way information flows through a, uh, a human population, uh, you want to understand the network structure, and this is what Milligram set out to look at. What is the network structure of the human society? It turns out he did this by posting letters, but it turns out, to cut a long story short, that you're roughly six to eight handshakes from anybody else on the planet. That's actually rather surprising, and this is referred to the small world, it, it has a big appeal in the popular press, and um, it's, it's kind of surprising because the density of the human graph, that's to say the number of connections that can exist, that do exist, is tiny, tiny, tiny. It's zero, zero, zero something or other you know a very small fraction of people on the face of the earth. And yet, you could, um, you could share a cold with the Queen of England very easily because you are six or seven handshakes. Now, um, there's mathematical definitions of that. And what I'm going to be showing you is, quite simply, that the, the interest of the topological network, uh, so it's a binary network, it's a network connected, not connected. It doesn't have any embeddedness in it. There's no notion of distance, so the, the, the human uh, network, uh, the six hands across the, across, the, uh, across the globe, doesn't take into account how far you are from the individuals that you know and how far they are from other individuals. There's no notion of distance. There's no notion of how well you know them. It, it, it counts as well as if you can give a cold to somebody you meet in a train as you can to your wife. So there's no notion of strength of connection. That doesn't come into it. The small world network is basically a binary, non-weighted, non-directed network. And the uh, popularity of, the, of this network for people interested in the brain 
is, of course, it, it suggests a high power of, of integration. Very few connections, a high economy of connectivity, and a high power of integration. And that is very appealing if you're trying to understand how the brain works. So I'm going to be arguing that um, the density of this, of this quartable graph uh, shows you quite simply that the small world network is, 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 is irrelevant in some sense. And um, I won't have time to do that, but for you, those of you who are in neuroscience, and I'm not quite sure what the population of the, of the, of the audience... Hands up, people doing neuroscience. So, it's, yeah, most people. So. Those of you that are involved in neuroscience might have heard of uh, the notion of hubs. Uh, people doing networks love hubs. They adore them. They, they, they live for hubs. They, they're really interested in hubs. So today I came from Lyon. Lyon is not a hub. And I fear to tell you this, but Trieste is not a hub either. So I had to go to Munich. Munich is a hub. And network scientists who picked up this topological network theory and applied it to the brain, were very interested in finding hubs. Hubs in the brain. These would be centers which would be dispatching information right, left, and center. And it was a very much a sort of network scientist approach where they imagined that the whole thing was working like in a telephone exchange where you would have some young girl taking in wires and plugging them in and connecting various parts of, of the brain to other parts of the brain. Of course, we know that the brain doesn't work like that. Synapses impinge on postsynaptic structures, and there's a message which is passed and integrated. There's no single message going from one neuron to the next. It's integrated into that neuron. So the whole notion of a hub makes absolutely no sense because everything would be integrated in that supposed hub. But nevertheless, they love hubs. And I'll explain some of the reasons why I think we got into this ridiculous pickle. Now, the, the hub leads on to another theory, which is the so-called rich club. So we're imagining that the, the brain is a small world. That is to say that it has a sparse connectivity, but in fact, at the aerial level, it's a dense connectivity. And we're imagining that you have hubs. The rich club is the notion that hubs, statistically speaking, are more interconnected amongst themselves than you would predict from the global statistics of that network. Uh, that's possible in a sparse network. It doesn't work in a very dense network. The normalization that you need to do doesn't work there. So I don't think there are rich clubs. They, they're called rich clubs, by the way, because traditionally men of power get themselves onto various boards where they make important decisions. And the rich club is the select combination of those men of power who meet in a rich club and make decisions about what they're going to do across all of these different boards. And when they decide what they're going to do, then it happens because they're in the rich club. And so the rich club notion applied to the brain is that you've got a set of hubs in your brain which when they get together, rule the roost. And they will decide exactly what's going to be going on across the brain. I don't think it works. But uh, I'm going to go through this because there's a bit of sociology here, which I think is important. I'm going to be showing you what are the publications that have made declarations about uh, the cortex being organized according to a rich club, and what is the database that they've been using to make those declarations. So. Um, Perhaps I could have a pointer. Uh, this is the density of the graph that we've been describing. This is a database that we've been describing. I mentioned earlier on. It has this density of under, just under 70%. And if you randomly remove connections, the average path length will go from something like one and a half hops. That's one and a half hops from any area to any other area. I told you, this is a high density, and most areas are connected with most areas. So the average path length is one and a half hops. And if you randomly remove connections, you get a certain degree of uncertainty, and the average path length goes from 1.5 up to something like three and a half percent, three and a half, three and a half hops between any area, and then the graph breaks up, and you have unreachability. 
So now I'm going to be showing you the various databases and the publications. Does anybody have a pointer? It would be, it would be useful. So um, it is sort of useful. If you look here, this, this database here, which is Solman and Van Essen, 1991, is the first useful database that you could use to make statements about the cortical network. And it was a collated, thank you, it's a collated database. So basically, David Van Essen and his, and his various students looked at some three or four hundred different papers and made up a collated database from these three or four hundred different studies. So there's not a common theme of parcellation. There's not a common plane of section which has been used. And so the interpretation is a little difficult. In, um, this is uh, the database of Feldman and Venessen. And if you read it carefully, they reported a density of something like 35%. And if you read it carefully, they said in the paper, but it's a very long paper, it's in the first edition of Cerebral Cortex, about 30 pages long. So very few people get to the end of that. But if you did get to the end of it, somewhere it says in there, that if you were to look at the uninvestigated connections, you would probably find a density of, the, of this region here, something about 45%. So they predicted that it was probably 45%. Then came uh, Jules Vetal in 1998. They took the same database as Van Essen, updated it. They did this in 1998, updated it, and they used a graph inference method, a sort of systematic imputation methodology using graph theory. And they predicted that you'd probably get a density of about 60%, which is not very much from what we're actually reporting actually exists, which is 67. So all this is very kind of predictable. A database in 1991, which a lot of connections were not reported back in 91, updated, predictions here of 60%, and in fact it's, it's a little bit more than what they predicted. The other experiments, all of these experiments here, all these publications here, so this is Hani et al, this is a PNS paper, Malcolm Young back in 93, uh, this is a, 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 an important paper, and this is a Modern and Singe paper, this is also in PNS, this is in 2010, and there's a lot of other papers which have been making the small world. Basically what they've done, they've take, taken this database here of, of uh, Feldman and Van Essen, and they've declared that the areas, that the connections that don't exist, that haven't been investigated, don't exist. Period. That's, what, that's how they treated them. And they've added new data onto their thing because they want to have something bigger and bigger, more, more areas so they can say this is more complete. And they haven't made, taken, gone to any length to find out about uh, what this incompleteness means in terms of uninvestigated connections. So their densities drop very rapidly down to 20% and modulin sins is around about 5%. Now this color coding, when we remove connections randomly, our graph here begins to break up. So we begin to get uh, unconnected areas. And according to how this works out, uh, this is the range where things become disconnected and here it is disconnected. These color codes, this applies here, this applies here, this becomes disconnected with one removal of an area. It becomes possibly disconnected. Model in Singe is already disconnected. It's already, there's all unreachability. You, there's areas you can't get to. The point I want to make here is that this uh, idea that you can have a topological network doesn't face up to the way the data is. I believe this is published, so it's gone through the gauntlet of review. I believe that this is, this is in a sense tragic because I think it blinded us to what was actually important and that's what I'm going to be arguing in favor of, a very different way of looking at the, at the network. But just to tick off the box, uh, let's have a look and see what density actually means in terms of graphs. This is a, um, a, the study of Watson Strogatz which was published in um, 1998, I think, in Nature. And they developed a very simple 
methodology for deciding if a network was, uh, could qualify as a small world or not. And basically what they were doing is uh, rewiring. So here you go from a regular lattice to a fully random network. And they do this by a rewiring paradigm. And when you rewire the, par the, the network in this fashion, you get a drop in the, on the path length. The average path length drops very rapidly. But the clustering index remains very high. The clustering index is a key feature to the small world network. The reason why you're six handshakes across the world is because of the friends of friends effects. That's a highly clustered graph. So most of the people you know, know each other. You're in a very clustered graph. And it's the high clustering which is the characteristic feature of the, of the small world. And the small world, according to Watson Stragatz, exists in this interval here, where you have a very high clustering index and you have a very short path length, which is basically indistinguishable from the path length you have in an average network. Now, uh, what I'm going to add in here is what happens if you look at the cortex and you rewire a network which corresponds to the cortex at, and you use these different densities. And this is using aerial density in the cortex going from 6% and you're simply adding in connections until you come to the fully connected graph. But what happens is you have no interval. So you have no position which corresponds to what the small world is meant to be because according to Strogatz and Watts algorithm, if you want to know if you have a small world, you rewire it. And if that leads to uh, a, a, a change in the um, path length and, and the clustering index is very high, then you can say this is a small world. So it's a test that you can apply to any network. If you apply this to this network, there will be no change in the path length. Path length is as short as it is because the density of the graph makes it like that. So, yes, you have a very short distance between any two nodes, but it's a simple consequence of the high density of the graph. Now, this high density of the graph, in and of itself, would be a kind of quiet death. If I tell you most areas are connected to any other area, if I tell you one more connection, it's going to tell you very, very little about the graph. It's not going to give you any information. If I say, hey, did you know V2 is actually connected to MT? You're going to say, yeah, so what? I mean, it's connected to most other areas. And so the key to this is not looking at the binary connectivity, but doing something which is much more painful, much more difficult in anatomy, which is looking at the strength of the connection. Now, I'm not going to go how we measure the strength of the connection, but it turns out to be a key feature. So it's not whether areas are connected, it's well, what, how strongly connected they are. It turns out that um, anatomists knew this all along because we know that visual areas are in the same constellation, they're in the same part of the cortex. Uh, auditory areas are in a similar constellation. Auditory areas are strongly connected with other auditory areas and only very weakly connected to visual areas and that's something to do with the way the brain works, I guess. And so um, we've used, a, 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 I'm not going to go into it, it's, 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 a, it's a, a technical detail, but we've been able to characterize the strength of the connection. And the strength of the connection has five to six orders of magnitude in range. So you go from very, very, very weak connections to amazingly strong connections. And I think that is a key feature. It's painful to measure this kind of thing, because um, that means you've got to do a lot of counting. And all of this work was uh, funded by the European Commission. And uh, it was a lot of counting involved. And many students who came for um, year after year and look at, looked at this kind of thing. And so you, we had to do a lot of counting. Since then, we've managed to automate things to some extent. But we, we had to go through this painful process. So um, when, you, when you look at the... If, you t if we now pool our, t our 29 uh, injections, we've made 29 injections in a total of 91 different areas. There's other ways of parcelating the cortex. You could actually go up to as many as 150, but I don't think it would change the results in any way. When, we've, uh, when we look at the results, we, we find the following characteristics. First of all, if we look at the, um, log the, the distribution of, of weights of areas, they follow a log-normal distribution. A log-normal distribution 
So if you plot the, the distribution on a log-log scale, you find this normal distribution. And this is highly characteristic of, of the nervous system. So there's a, a paper by um, Baragaki, no, Buzaki, uh, review paper in Neuron a few, a few two years ago, where he was looking at uh, spine counts, where he's looking at uh, distributions of connections between cortical areas, he's looking at uh, numbers of synapses on cells, and he's finding this log normal distribution over and over again. If you now look at the, um, the range of distances, the range of distances are normally distributed, that's not very surprising, but now if we look at this strength of connection, it turns out that the strength of connection goes over these five orders of magnitude, and over distance there's a very regular decline, and that decline is exponential, and so nearby areas are very strongly connected, whereas the very far distance areas are very weakly connected. I won't have time to talk about the weak connections, but I think there's, a, there's something very important there. You can say they don't exist, but if you come back to social networks, there's the the importance of the weak connection, which was a, a graph uh, measure made in the, in the 80s um, by Granvetter, who was interested in social cohesion. What keeps people together, according to Granvetter, was actually a lot to do with the weak connection. The odd person that he would, uh, you would meet in a train who would tell you about something which would lead you to getting a job or what have you, would have an important role in your life as your spouse or children or something else. But so he was very interested in the role of these weak connections. And I think that the, the weak connections are these connections that come right across the cortical graph, where any, anything coming across that weak connection is totally unexpected. And there, I think, is something terribly interesting. And those are the connections which I believe have been partially rubbed out by the people who've been maybe not very uh, careful about, about their database. So, uh, nearby connections are very strongly connected, far distant connections are very weakly connected. And the uh, physicists that we've been working with took these, uh, this data here and said, well, let's generate networks and see, using these, these uh, distributions, picking out numbers out of a, uh, uh, until you build up a network which has the same density as the, as the cortical graph, and then we can ask this network does it behave in a way that the cortical graph does? Does it have characteristics and features? And it does. I'm not going to go through the full range of features it has, but I'll just give an example of this. So we've built these networks, or rather the, the physicists who are part of this consortium have built these networks and then tested them for various characteristics. And one characteristic I will go through is this paper from, from Yuri Allen's group in, in the Weizmann Institute where they've taken combinations of nodes from a network and looked at the characteristic connectivity of those nodes. So this is the frequency that these connections will exist. And if you, if you take three nodes, you could take two, you could take four, you could take five, but these are three node graphs, subgraphs, going from the fully connected triangle to the completely un unconnected. The idea is that the frequency of these different motifs will have something to do with the transmission. And it turns out to be actually very much the case. If I get round to talking about the mouse data, we find that the motive distribution looks very similar. But just let me go through this with you. This is now looking at the macaque, and it's looking simply at the data. This is the frequency of the different motifs. So the fully connected triangle is the most frequent motif. And um, there's some motifs which are really hated. This is A going to B, going to C, going back to A. Very, very rare. And we'll see more evidence of this. This is now looking at the exp uh, exponential distance rule networks, networks which we built applying this exponential distance rule as a probability of being connected. And you see that they, they uh, give you motive distribution which looks actually very, very similar to the, um, to the distribution you get. And in blue here, this is now building uh, the same kind of uh, network, but using a constant distance rule. And here you find that the, the uh, frequency of connections is very rare. So this ABC, this, tri this, uh, this amplificating feedback cycle, this cyclic connectivity, you can see is actually 
discriminated against. You find it less than you would predict by random. Now, the, the, um, the, this is the mouse data, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So if you, uh, the other things we've been able to do is um, you could ask yourself, what about if you were to remove move the areas around on the surface of the cortex? Could you reduce the amount of wire? This idea of wire minimization has been around now since a long time. The idea is that, the, that the, a design feature which is very pervasive in the brain is that you minimize the length of axon that you actually are using. So the question that immediately comes to mind, if you think about it, if nearby areas are strongly connected and very far distant areas are either not connected or weakly connected, it would suggest that the optimal placement of the areas is the placement which they have. That there isn't a possibility of moving the areas around and reducing the amount of wire. And indeed, this turns out to be the case. That might not be very surprising to you, but there was a publication which was getting some kind of credence from the small world gang, which was going in an opposite direction, which was suggesting that you could actually minimize wire. And I think that that's, it's worth noting that that's not the case. So this is simply um, coming back to this idea now. So this is a macaque. I've told you that uh, the exponential distance rule, the strength of connection is a probability predicts the uh, motive distribution. I've told you that it uh, allows a wire minimization. And if you look at the efficiency, the global or local efficiency as, a, as a, a diffusion factor, it predicts that as well. In fact, it predicts more or less everything that we can look at in, in those terms, in terms of what you could then observe in the actual biological network, as it were. Now, um, what happens as brains get bigger? Ringo, this is a paper by somebody called Ringo, who was part of a, um, a group, he's no longer in the business now, but uh, it will come back to me, in 1991, pointed out that as, air, as brains get bigger, there's going to be an explosion in the number of, area, uh, number of connections between areas. And yet, if you look at them, this is a mouse brain, and you look at the human brain, what's immediately apparent is that there's a big expansion in the white matter. This would the white matter is where the connections are. So the gray matter is where the neurons are, and the white matter is where the myelated connections are. And there's a, a big expansion in the, in the white matter, which would seem to be going along with what Ringo was saying. It actually turns out that there's a decrease in the number of, of, of wire because the relative proportion of the wire isn't followed. In fact, if... Um, if my brain was built according to the mouse brain, it would be like this. It would be very, very large. So you make your brain bigger because you want to have more neurons, and uh, you want to have more neurons because you want to have more connections, but then you have to go through this wire minimization. You actually have less wire per neuron than, than you would if you was a very small brain. And this is simply a design constraint. So you could imagine that this wire minimization, which is the consequence of the, simply the increase in the brain size, is going to be a major feature which will change something. So on a, a, an embedded network, I've been telling you that the, the rules governing the connections between cortical areas is very much to do with strength of connection and distance. As the, as if you want to have strongly connected areas, you put them together. By the way, there's no such thing as two adjacent areas which are not interconnected doesn't exist. And a number of people have asked me about that over the years. And it's, it's, it's not there. It doesn't exist. So the way the brain has evolved is, is very much to do with the, the placement of areas being, in some sense, highly optimal. I think it says something very deep about the basic bow plan of, of the cortex. So we, we looked at the mouse. I, I had no expectations. And I was, uh, as you'd say in, in English, gobsmacked by what we actually found. So this is just to remind you about the, the vast range of size of the cortex. We've been looking at macaque, and I can't find mouse here because uh, I don't know where it is, but we've looked at macaque, and we've also looked at microcebus. Microcebus is a, a little critter that uh, John Cass is rather fond of. It's about a centimeter or so. It's actually the smallest primate. There's a bit of a problem here because we're going to be comparing a large, large-ish macaque brain, which is a primate, 
with a rather small mouse, which is a rodent. And Herkin and Huzel, uh, in 2012, has shown that the scaling rules for primates and rodents is actually quite different. In other words, as brains get bigger, mice and, and rodents and, and, and uh, primates, including humans, don't do exactly the same thing. What she's saying is that um, as the mouse brain gets bigger, the neurons get bigger. All species do exactly the same. And it's the same thing with the primate. Primate brain gets bigger, the neurons get bigger, but much less so. So in fact, the human brain has more neurons than you know, the big uh, non-primate non, non brains. And because the neurons don't get that much bigger, they get a little bit bigger, but not that much. And that, that's an important uh, design feature which is different. So to cut a long story short, this is a beautiful, um, this is now mouse. So we're looking at this, this is mouse, and we're looking at the decline in strength of connection with distance. And we're looking at uh, it's about four orders of magnitude. So the range of strength of connections doesn't seem to be that great. This is using our own data. Um, in terms of strength of connection, but we'll be applying the, the, um, the networks we've been using are, are those published by the Allen Brain Institute and, and the study in Southern California that I showed you earlier on. Um, what's interesting now is if you look at the distance distribution, there is a little bit of a difference here. We think this might be important, but the distance distribution, so we put them on a normalized template so that they, they both fit. The mouse is is purple colored, the macaque is, is light blue, and you can see that the, the macaque is more pointed. And I think that this, we think that this is perhaps playing a role here. So when you, when you then come back and we, we look at the, uh, the, the, free, uh, the uh, free motive distribution, we throw everything we can at it, it turns out that the, the, the exponential measurement that we made of fall off of connectivity strength with distance in the mouse leads to an exponential distance rule which is exactly the same, which is just as efficient in predicting motive distribution as it was in the macaque. So that it would appear that this is now a, a very much a, a constant feature. So we're finding basically exponential distance rule is working very well in the, in the mouse as it is in the macaque. And that would suggest that it's rather, it's kind of rather universal. Now, can it make any predictions? Can this weight, this, this weight strength distance relationship, the fact that strongly, strong connections over distance decline in a very predictable fashion, can that lead to predictions other than what we've been looking at? And I think it, maybe it can. I'm going to look, first of all, at what about local circuits? And then what about functional streams in the cortex. So in terms of local circuits, what we've been describing so far is the network of cortical areas. So this is representing the cortical areas. But if you look now within an area, you have a local network. It turns out that 80 to 90 percent of the connections of the cortex are local. And by local, I mean a millimeter or two. So that really is local. There's a huge amount of machinery there. So that the, the connections between areas are very, very far and few between. The real machinery of what the cortex is doing is in the local one or two millimeters. So you have this big recurrent excitation, this amplification of signals which are coming in, and this is where the business end of the cortex really is. So um, there's a recent study by Kossel et al. in Nature in 2015, and this is something they've been publishing for a while. It's a, it's a, a, a very, very interesting and very dynamic group in Basel now. They were at University College London, where they're looking at the connections between adjacent neurons. So we're now in this local circuit. What does the local circuit look like? Well, I told you earlier on that it has a log-normal distribution of weights in exactly the same way that we find a log-normal distribution of weights between cortical areas. And if you, if you look back in this, in this paper of Kossel et al., this Thomas Flugel paper, uh, Flugel, Mersic, Flugel Mersic, it's a Croatian, Croatian name, not far from here, Croatia, yeah. Um, uh, he's the, he's the, uh, the PI there. Uh, what it turns out is that you have very, very strong connections between uh, neurons with 
similar receptive field properties. And you have weak connections, or vanishingly weak connections, between neurons which have dissimilar receptive field properties. So basically, at the local circuit level, you're finding the same mystery, if you like, that you're finding at the inter-aerial level. At the inter-aerial level, the weak connections are the ones that people have been throwing out and saying, well, you know, it's a weak connection, and it's halfway across the brain, we don't have to bother about that. Entre parenthèses, uh, by the way, when we look, when we do repeat injections, we find these very, very weak connections across the brain are highly, highly repetitive. You find them in every individual. They're not sometimes there and sometimes not there. They're, 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 very, um, they're very regular, in fact. So they find exactly the same thing. And I, I, I'm, I'm sort of wondering if some kind of uh, embeddedness isn't existing at the local circuit level. I haven't nothing else to go on and the fact that the, the findings in, in terms of probability of connectivity which is being found by Mercer Flugel's group and the strength of connection but it's a it's a thought but now um, where we have another prediction and we've, we've, we've just been following this up um, this is looking at a flat map this is you, you take the cortex you strip the white matter away and you iron it out you flatten it it's a, a flat representation. This was done by David Van Essen back in 1991. The same David Van Essen that did the 1991 database that people said, you know, they, took, uh, they weren't respectful to it. So this is flattened. And these shapes are really intriguing. This is area V1. Area V1 is the primary visual area. It's the area that receives the input from the, the retina, goes to the lateral geniculate, goes to area V1, and then from V1 it goes marching out to the secondary areas and, and right up to the uh, peripheral areas. And uh, this is area 46. And so if you look at these shapes, what I've been telling you is that the, the strength of connection is determined by the physical distance. So if I'm looking at area V2 here, this part of the area V2 is the foveal representation. This is where the fovea is. This part of V2 is the peripheral representation. So when you're riding your bicycle, this part of the visual stream is terribly important. If you have no peripheral vision, you can't ride your bicycle. It's gone. Bicycle riding is out. But you have your fovea, and if you have no peripheral vision but you have your fovea, you can recognize faces, you can read a book, uh, you can put thread into a needle, uh, anything to do with the fovea, this very close vision is very different. It turns out, if you look here, that this fovea representation is in this vicinity, and this peripheral representation is in a completely different vicinity. So the exponential distance rule would say that the strength of connection should, of the fovea should be with these areas, these areas should be strongly connected to this part of the of V2, and this part of V2 should be strongly connected with these areas. It turns out that this is what people refer to as the ventral uh, stream, and the ventral stream and the dorsal stream. So um, neurobiologists are very simplistic. We have left and right, we have dorsal and ventral, minus and plus, and so the ventral stream has been posited as a stream which is leading into the hippocampus, which is important for uh, recognizing objects and, and what have you, whereas this dorsal stream is to do with spatial interactions and riding bicycles, for example. So we have a very simple prediction. The fovea here should be connected strongly with the ventral stream, and the periphery here should be connected strongly with the, the, um, with the dorsal stream. And it turns out it's beautiful. It's absolutely the case. In fact, you could think of the you could name the ventral stream the foveal stream, and you could name the dorsal stream the peripheral stream, and it would be perfectly adequate. And so these streams have been, I, I, I think there's two-thirds of you do neurobiology, and I don't know how many of you are interested in the cortex, but these two streams have been a lot, have been guiding a lot about what we feel, how we feel the visual system is actually working. And so this taking on board this notion that the strength of not just being or not being connected, the binary uh, definition of connectedness, but actually the strength of the connection leads you to a very simple prediction which turns out to be right, which has been satisfactory. By the way, for the uh, avocados here, the specialists here, there's a bit of a problem for the upper visual field. The upper visual field is actually very near the ventral stream. <laughs> 
and it's heavily connected with it, and I don't know why. So, um, in my introduction, I, I briefly mentioned uh, that actually physiologists are much more interested in hierarchy. I'm going to go through this very quickly because I think I'm over time. And so, um, before I get, th this is particularly for Matthew, I promised to send you a, um, uh, a picture of this. One of the interesting things that comes out of this, so you remember I said, well, for the people we're collaborating with who are network scientists, high density graphs, they, they hate them. They, they can see no, no specificity. They see very little that you can do with a high density graph. And a homogeneous graph even less. So you can understand the desire to see hubs when I talk to these people. So what we did um, in the macaque graph is we looked to see if there was a... a um, if there was a, a, a homogeneous representation. In fact, we were able to show that you have a hub area, um, a core, not hub, sorry, of highly interconnected uh, areas with two kind of wings. And we proposed this as a, uh, we call it a, a we did not we call it, it corresponds to a bow tie topography. And you have differences in the feedback and feed forward. But basically, you have a dichotomy, you have a strongly interconnected core with a periphery. It turns out that the areas in the macaque, which are members of this core set, are all in the prefrontal cortex, or largely predominated by the prefrontal cortex. When we do the same thing in the mouse, it's very interesting, but it's not predominantly uh, the same, because we find a lot of these primary areas which are interconnected in this, in this core region. And I think that says something which we don't quite understand, but we were going along with the idea that this notion of a core set, so it's highly interconnected, it's not a, it's not a hub, I use that word uh, by mistake, <laughs> it's not a hub, but it's highly interconnected and it fits with this notion of a global workspace, which has been an idea pushed by Sandhahas de Hen, which is this idea that you have to have a a global level of, of, of activity in a number of areas before anything is going to reach consciousness. So it's a, there's a lot of um, papers which they've sort of followed up from that. So now I'm going to say something very, very quickly about hierarchy because I think it really is interesting. This is the original database of Vanessa and Fellman in 1991. It's hierarchical and they were able to classify a feed forward and a feedback direction. Feed forward is coming in from the retina to the lateral genicula to area V1 to V2 and you march out until you come to area 46 which is in the prefrontal cortex. And as you go up the hierarchy the cortical, the, the receptive fields get in the visual system get larger and larger and if you silence an area down here the subsequent area tends not to respond anymore. So one hypothesis is that the connections going in the feed forward direction contribute to constructing the receptive field structure of the area which is at the higher level. The mystery is the connections running in the opposite direction. If you silence one of these areas, Jean Boulier and others have done this kind of experiment, but let's just say the deficits you get in the earlier areas are extremely subtle. Now from a connectivity point of view, the thing you need to know is that the number of connections going in that direction, going in the feed forward, are as numerous as they are in the opposite direction. So there's not a predominance of feed-forward connections. In fact, they're as numerous. And Victor Lam and, and Peter Rosema and many people have done a lot of interesting experiments looking at these top-down effects and, and, and speculating about the difference of these different things. This is taken from a Malcolm Young um, uh, field of interest, but it's simply to say that uh, in, in uh, this paper of Malcolm Young's group, they looked at this network, this uh, hierarchy, and they, they, they looked at uh, the, the number of levels of uncertainty, and it turned out that there's 150,000 equally plausible solutions to the particular hierarchy which is there. And this uncertainty is largely because of an, a lack of precise notion of distance. There's an arbitrariness in the way that these areas are being placed at different levels. We could go into that, but one solution to that is to work out a hierarchical distance, and I, I can ask those questions on that, and that's what we've done, and that allows us to propose a, a, 
a, a finite solution to the particular hierarchy that could be, it could be presented. Now this is simply um, referring back now to why do we think the hierarchy is going to be important? What are the, what are the current ideas about hierarchical processing which suggest that this is somehow very deep? So it's a fact. Small worlds are not interesting. But it's the fact that you have multiple areas dealing with vision. You have multiple areas dealing with audition. The differences between these areas in terms of the receptive field characteristics can be really rather subtle. So there seems to be a basic paradigm which is set up that you have this notion of a hierarchy. You have a higher area and a lower area and they're speaking to each other and they're doing something and we would like to know what are the general principles which are behind this. So an idea uh, of uh, coming back to Helmholtz is this notion of unconscious inference, which was given a lot of popularity by Richard Gregory, who died some three or four years ago. And uh, Richard Gregory uh, kind of came back to Helmholtz and said, what the brain is actually doing is making hypotheses about what is actually out there. It's generating a theory about the world we're confronted in. So this idea of, of perception as hypothesis has been taken up by Carl Christen and, and his colleagues and is now articulated into a predictive coding idea which is a generative model and there's other people besides Carl that have, have made major contributions here so I'm, I'm glossing over this. But the idea is that the, the perception of the world that you have is defined by your experience. In, in, in of the world and that experience can be locked up into the, into the gene structure. It, it's something which is, it, you're generating a, a, a theory of that world but it doesn't mean it's uh, experience in the sense of Colin Blakemore with visual experience in the kitten and what have you. It's a, a notion which is a, a little richer in that. But you see, if, if I show you this shape here, this shape here is perceived as sticking out and this shape here is perceived as sticking in. If I turn this upside down, this becomes that, and that becomes this. And what stuck out now sticks in. So shadow at the top of an object looks like something which is sticking in. Shadow at the bottom of an object is, looks like something which is sticking out. And one explanation of why this should be the case is that light in our world usually comes from above. It actually usually comes from above and from the left. I don't know why the left it, there's a slight tendency in psychophysics to have shown that to be the case. And so this would be um, a kind of one of the many kind of illusions that people have pointed to which underlines the idea that the brain can be tricked into making very, very simple kinds of mistakes according to, um, according to this notion that it's generating a hypothesis. So Carl Friston has formalized mathematically these ideas, I'm not going to go into that now, but it all passes around the idea of hierarchical processing. So hierarchical processing, this is the David Van uh, model of the cortex, V1, V2, V3, V3A, V4, this is the, the ventral stream I talked about, this is the dorsal stream I talked about, NT is a motion area if you like, and 8N, 8L, this is the frontal eye field. We've now come back to this hierarchy using this quantitative data and using this notion of hierarchy of distance, we have an index which does that, and looked at the network, and this is what we get. It looks actually very similar. V1, V2, here you have the ventral stream areas, here you have the dorsal stream areas, but the major difference, this is 8L, this is the small saccade representation region of the frontal eye field. It's at the same level as V4. This is a prefrontal area, this is a, 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 the occipital parietal junction, if you like. And so this prefrontal area is now at a very, very low level. And that's kind of intriguing. Because we know there's a lot of attentional sort of features that comes into that. So I'm running out of time, but just to give you a flavor of what you can do with this now, is you can define uh, the areas on the macaque monkey using um, the uh, hierarchical distance, which is defined structurally. You can then use, and this is not this is not me, this is um, Pascal Fries and his group, and this was published uh, last year in, in, in Neuron. You can then look at the, uh, the 
oscillatory coherence in the cortex and define a functional hierarchy because of the way that the gamma and, and beta oscillation coherence fits onto this. I, 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 we can talk about this if anybody's interested, but you're deriving a functional hierarchy by looking to see what are the functional characteristics, and it's, it's rather beautiful, it's a rather beautiful piece of work of Pascal Fries's group. And he's recently taken this one step further, he's now using Meg, and this is published in 2016, because he can now say, okay, I have homologous areas in the, in the macaque and in the human, I know what these areas are, I know what the functional and structural hierarchy is in the monkey, I can then ask myself, do I get the same functional relationship in the human uh, for those areas which are homologous with the, with, the, with the macaque? And I do. And then if I say, okay, it works for those areas, what does that give me amongst the other areas? And this is a hierarchy which is based on that. This was published last year, um, in last January. And so basically you've been able to derive uh, a functional hierarchy for the human. And I think this is going to be highly interesting because it will allow you to uh, have this, a more detailed approach to the predictive coding kind of question. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm running over time and I'm, I'm really sorry about that, but it's important that I make these uh, indications of the people who, who played a very, very much a key role here. Uh, Ken Knobloch is uh, a statistician who's been working, we've been working together now for a number of years and He's played a, a, an enormous role in, in enabling us to, with a very, very uh, actually spotted um, manpower, to be able to make statistically uh, significant statements with incomplete data, and that's been, that's been very important. He's also been very much a translator. This is uh, the physicist we've been collaborating with at Notre Dame, and his postdoc is now back in, uh, in Romania. And so we've been, all of this work has been done very much in in tandem with um, Zoltan Korokai and, and uh, Marek F.K. Uh, Ravas, and this has been, uh, they, they, they've had a huge contribution to these, these papers, looking at the exponential distance rule and, and using these graph theoretic inferences and, and what have you. David Van Essen has played a major role in, in, in many stages of the, of the work. Uh, Nicholas Markov is a, a brilliant, is a brilliant guy. He's now with Tim. Uh, Bushman at Princeton. He um, was on a lot of the papers that were required to bring this stuff out. And um, uh, this is Pascal Fries and, and his student, Bizoli, uh, uh, with whom we were involved in trying to find a functional hierarchy using the SLA. And this is, I haven't talked about this, but Gao Jing Wang, we've been able to, to look at uh, other dynamic models using these data. Thank you very much for your attention. So, it says time for questions. Sorry about running over time. So I just have a question about the way you measure the weights basically between your neurons and how it affects the results and if you think that there may be even a better way of measuring weights that would yield better results or more consistent results in general. Absolutely, yes. I think there's far better ways. We're, be, we're counting numbers of neurons that are back labeled, so we're injecting retrograde traces and uh, we count the total number of neurons which are labeled across the brain and we express the number in any particular structure as a percentage. So the size of the injection is normalized and doesn't affect the, the and we can make comparisons. When we do this across individuals we get very consistent results. But of course that has only a, it has a, it, the neuron has a, is a structure which has a, a sort of formalization to it but it doesn't tell you about the synaptic weight it's very difficult to look at synaptic weights because um, the Allen Brain Institute has used anti-grade tracing. So this is retrograde tracing. Now you can, if you want to, um, you would actually have to count synapses, which of course you can't do, so then you do optical measurements. And, and the relationship between uh, 
the numbers of synapses and the optical measurement is terribly indirect because the axon itself uh, is going to be taking up a lot of the signal. So there's a difficulty there. But uh, I think that the, the, the real way forward will be to have a, a much more sophisticated measure of synaptic strength. And that, uh, of course, is possible at the single neuron level. This is what people like um, the mercic flugel study that I told you about. But if you could do that at the at the inter-aerial level, that will give you a much more, uh, I think, much more significant measure. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, I have a question regarding the fact that you said that when your brain is increasing, so when basically when you have an increased number of neurons, then you have a reduction in number of connections. Otherwise, our brain should have been. If you if you scale the mouse mo my brain. You have to have a huge brain. And the fact that also the neurons are increasing, but not that much. So there are more number of neurons in our brain. So what is, is there any prediction of the limit of the increase of brain size? Therefore, for instance, what would be for, for animals, for biological uh, living animals, what is the limit of increasing the brain, brain size? Mm. Is there any limit? or I think there might be. Maybe the human beings at that limit. If you... When we, when we look in the mouse and the microcebus, so the microcebus is, is sort of, um, it's a primate, and it has some of the long distance connections that you find in the macaque. And so you could say, well, this long distance connection is present in the microcebus, it's a, it's a small primate, it's present in the macaque, it's a long distance connection, it's probably there in the human. In the human, it's going to be the long distance, it's going to be going from here to there, it's actually uh, V2 projecting to area 10, which is the rostral pole which is hugely important in humans and, and uh, there's no reason to believe that that connection wouldn't exist. If it does exist, you can make a prediction when we compare our mouse data to the macaque data that that connection is going to be tiny. It's going to be very, very, very small. And so I'm, I'm, we're wondering if uh, the problem is not going to be that the long distance connections in, in humans are going to be so small that the possibility of disconnection could become a real factor. And it might lead to a sort of fragility that you might expect in the, in the brains of our species. Um, and so you think about autism and schizophrenia and, and Alzheimer. There's a, more and more people are thinking of Alzheimer now as a disconnection syndrome. And so if these long distance connections are tiny, and I think they will be tiny, then that will give a sort of fragility. So from our comparison, with the, with the, more with the microcebus to the macaque, the idea coming from that is that the, there's a homology of long distance connections. They do seem to be present in the same way. And they are weaker in the macaque than they are in the microcebus. And I think they will be weaker still in the human. So the bigger brain must be a problem. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I have one specific question and one more general evolutionary uh, oriented question. One, uh, the specific question I have is to say that there are the, uh, the weak connections between areas are highly important and, and reproducible among different brains that you look at mm -hmm. of, of the same species. Um, are these the same as the, the numerous feedback connections that you said? Uh, yes. The, the there is a tendency for the feedback connections to be l over greater distances, and so they are m often weaker. And we've looked at the same, we've done our injections in a stereotypic fashion across individuals, and looked to see if these weak connections are consistent, but, and they are. So the, the very weak connections will tend to be more often feedback than feed forward. Okay, great. And uh, the other question is, um, so I, oh, before your talk, I, I thought that the, the connectivity in the brain and how we end up connecting different areas into one another in any individual brain is more of a uh, developmental, right, a, a packing problem. That doesn't really matter, like the, the length of the connections. And I, I thought that this is, this is a series of serious developmental constraints. Mm -hmm. But now you're saying that uh, if you change how each of these networks are connected to one another, it, it breaks down. So the, the network does not function. It, as if um, 
the uh, so the connect long range connections do matter how 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 they are constructed defines the the function of the of the entire brain i uh you know this thing about clocks on a wall? They all end up uh, with the same beat? Yes. The yeah. the very, very weak signals can have an enormous orchestrating yeah. influence. I wonder if these long-range connections might not have a large effect because they're coming from numerous places as well. So if you look in a particular region, occipital cortex, for example, and you look at the long-distance connections, all of the occipital regions tend to get similar source areas projecting to them. So there's a sort of long distance signature as well. So one of the ideas that we have is that these long distance connections could have an unexplored specificity. They have an, an explored specificity structurally, that's what we've been doing. We can show that they're consistent but whether they have a functional. You mentioned development. Developmentally, um, these long distance connections are amazing. Uh, we have a developmental neurobiologist here, but people looking at uh, development of connections, one of the things that strikes one is that the outgrowth of axons occurs when the brain is still very, very small. And so the distances are smaller, but they're still huge in developmental terms. So making connections which are very precise over these distances is, is, is a challenge. My work with Collector Hay has been a lot on challenging this idea that specificity in the adult is a consequence of pruning. But pruning lingers on in the literature. I don't believe in pruning. I think pruning has been overstated. So I think that these long distance connections are actually set up as such from a very early, I expect them to be set up as such at a very, very early stage. And I think that is in itself a challenge to the system. Whereas the very strong local connections are not because uh, you're going to have a pioneer axon and you, everything is going to the same place and they're coming over very short distances. But the long distance connections are going through, if you look at Pandya's book on the white matter, you can see that it's a spaghetti junction. It's amazing that anything can grow through this and get to anywhere. And they do. And they go to the same place. It's like a, one of these geese that takes over from Canada and lands on a particular rock in the Baltic. And it doesn't land on the rock next to it. It lands on that rock. So there's a, there's an, a, a guidance problem which is, which is acute, I think. You would think that this is a, hi a highly conserved feature through evolution. I think it might be, yes, because we're finding similar long distance connections across a species like uh, Microcebus, which is, uh, you know, very, very small. It's a mouse lemur, it's about that big, and, and the macaque, which is about that big, and the brain is proportionally the same in difference. So, yes, I think they're highly conserved. Mm -hmm. So no, just to react on that and link to my previous question is that somehow would there be a way of measuring weights in more of an information processing way which would really consider functionally how it affects um, other neurons. For example, like uh, the similarly with the Granovetter paper that somehow it, it may be a weak tie structurally because the person that we don't know very well, but this person can have like huge effects on our life and that's what Granovetter showed basically in his paper. So there may be a way, but maybe smarter way of, a different way at least of measuring weights that would actually account more for the functioning and for the dynamics of the brain. That could be something that could also yield a lot of insights about what is really going on. And the structure of the network according to these weights may have a very different shape yeah. compared to the structural one. Well, so Nicholas Markov has gone, who's now with Tim Bushman, has looked at that using optogenetics. So he's looked, at some of these, he's looked at some of these very long distance connections using optogenetics as a way of activating a very weak connection over a long distance. Um, the problem when you use optogenetics in that way is it, everything's going to, you're going to activate a group of neurons simultaneously. So you're kind of, uh, you might be able to detect influences of weak connections which are actually very, very, very artificial. But 
That's, that's one possibility. That's one, one way of looking at it. I think perhaps a, a, a more uh, sophisticated way of using optogenetics is probably going to be the long run. And the other kind of thing one can think of is doing a tracing experiment. And we're looking at this with Pascal Fries. Doing a tracing experiment with uh, labeled neurons that you can then activate. So then you have your structural network and you can activate those neurons and look at how this influences the, the oscillatory coherence, which is uh, what we'd be measuring in these experiments. More question? So as there are no more clever questions, I will ask a silly one. Uh, do left-handed people also expect light uh, to come from, from the left? I've, I don't really know that experiment, those experiments very well, but there's a whole, if you go on Wikipedia, there's a whole industry about looking at this effect of light and, and shape and shading. And, and, um, and so Ken, Ken, Kenneth McCormack, who I referred to in my talk, is a psychophysicist, and he's been involved with that kind of work at one point or another. So all I know is that it's, I mean, obviously light from above, this is the, the, the standard response, but people like... Uh, I keep my light, my, my table lamp, on the left, right? Okay. And I do expect to light yeah. to come from the left, but I'm right-handed. I was wondering if... I, I, I don't know why. The, it, there's, a, there's a tendency, there's a, a, a paper by, by a Parisian group suggesting that it's slightly more to the left than it is anywhere else, but I have no idea about that. Well, I, think, I think we're done, but actually I have one more question. The, the, the theme going through this is connectivity and function, but I'm ha having a hard time understanding how there can really be any difference between them because what gives neurons functional properties besides intrinsic, proper intrinsic uh, properties and so on is the input that they get. And so I'm, as you were talking, I couldn't think of any reason why there should be func there, there could be functional properties of a cortical region that are not predicted by the connectivity. Mm. C can, does that occur? I mean, can, are there cases in which the a neuron a region has completely different functional properties from what would be expected by what it's connected to? Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting... You know, if you look at the number of areas, so uh, there's 91 areas in our you know, an atlas, and um, the range is about 30 to 70 areas projecting on average to any given area. So just from a sort of connectivity profile, why do you have so many areas projecting to that area? So it, 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 what I think this leads to is a much more interconnected, at the aerial level, it's much more interconnected than we think. And so my detractors say, but Henry, you know, this Rodney Douglas says, Henry, the bandwidth of these long distance connections, they're just, it's just fluff. You don't have to worry about that. But the bandwidth of the strong connections is fluff. If you think about the local connectivity, if you look at the LGN coming into area V1, it's actually at very, very much at the high end of things. So there's a whole lot of connections which are, are in the textbooks, which are orders of magnitude weaker than you would expect in terms of the functional input. And they're connections that you've been born and bred on. Those are the connections that everybody's been reporting for years and years. So why things are so interconnected, I think, is not being... We're, we're looking for functions. We're, we're very interested in the ventral stream, because it's what, and, and the... Uh, uh, the dorsal stream because it's where or something like that and, and we see these two different functions and we're quite happy to be able to say ah face recognition is in the ventral stream but, but then when finally we find face recognition actually in the dorsal stream it's sort of there's a little bit of a pebble it's a neuron paper but we pass on to something else so we, we've been driven by, by looking for um, function tightly associated to one place of course the interesting thing is that the brain is, is, has localization. I think we're quite clear about that. But there's a high degree of connectivity, which I, I don't think we've been thinking about. I don't know if this is answering your question. But, I, you know, I've, I've given talk in, to physiologists. And 
they say, that I've, I've had this, you know, people will stand up and say, but yeah, this is fine, but you know, basically you want to know how the brain works. And I'm saying, well, yeah, but if you know how it's connected, that's sort of one step in that direction. Structure and function go hand in hand. Um, but it's a little bit like Hubel and Weasel and Peter Bishop, you know. Peter Bishop was completely interested in the physiology, but never worried about where his electrode was, you know, it was somewhere, it was a visual thing. You, you put a shadow on the thing and uh, your neurons crackled and what have you. And then Hubel and Weasel said, oh yeah, but what layer, what area? And, and they kind of built up on that. So that there is a tendency, and so, you know, you can sort of come back to the, uh, the DNA code and say, well, we first of all need a structure, and then we found the code, and then we could find actually, a, we could understand the function, because we, we need something about the structure. And I think they, these things go hand in hand. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.